Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this time that we can come together. I thank you for the Sabbath day. Lord, I ask that you would use me and help me to uh, spread your word and what you would have me to say and nothing else and nothing more. Lord, we thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of my presentation is Coexist. And um, I don't know why we're not seeing slides there yet. Is there anything that I can do to help make that? Oh, let's try this. Maybe this makes the difference. Yes, there were things I could do to help make that happen. Um, I entitled this Coexist. I don't know, are there, can we turn down the lights on the, on the screen or not? Um, but be that as it all may, I titled this Coexist. I could have just as easily titled it Evolve for reasons that you will see as we go through this presentation. But tonight we're going to be talking about the emergent church. There's really nothing new about the emergent church. Um, it's, it's really based on old, old heresies, old problems that have been around for a long, long time. And I could really start telling the story of the emergent church all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Um, and I will mention a little bit about the Garden of Eden, but we won't focus our time there. But I put together this slide as a way of kind of being an overview, and you can kind of see where we're going and what we're going to be talking about. Um, and so what this is is just a mishmash of all the different issues that, are, that I think are related and core to the emergent church. If you see at the top there, that's Sigmund Freud in the center. You recognize Karl Marx sitting down there with his hand in his coat. Um, at the bottom, you have Charles Darwin. All these guys lived at about the same time, and they all had very large influence in changing the way we think. And a lot of this was related to what happened during the French Revolution. I was trying to think of a symbol that I could use for the French Revolution, and what I ended up with was the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which is over there in the, uh, in the far right. Some of you may recognize that. I think it's no accident that they made it look like the Ten Commandments and that they wanted to replace the Ten Commandments. One of the things that is really sad in America today, at least if you're in my generation or younger, I, don't, I can't speak for those of you that went through the system before, we do a really poor job of teaching our history. We do a poor job of teaching about the American Revolution at this point in time, and we do a horrible time talking about the French Revolution. Now, some people think that the American Revolution and the French Revolution were kind of the same thing, two peas in a pod. Um, They're both going for freedom. But that's really not true. If anything, they were very, very different. The American Revolution was the outworking of Protestant principles. It was the outworking of, of Protestantism on government. And it wasn't the creation of a Protestant government. I do lectures on religious liberty, and I like to get into this. We don't have time to get into this now. The French Revolution, though, was also looking for freedom, but instead of being an outwork of Protestant principles, it was a rejection of all things religious. And it was a movement towards atheism. And while some of the freedoms looked fairly similar, um, the philosophies were very, very different. It's been said that every revolution since the French Revolution was a continuation of the French Revolution. And I think certainly up till 2001, that would be a very true statement. So when you saw all the different revolutions, there were many revolutions in Europe, and then they eventually, we saw the communist revolutions. The communist revolutions are all a continuation of the French Revolution. Hence, the statement, viva la revolution, you know, may the revolution live. So looking at this, um, this spawned things like the New Age movement eventually, the flower children. Vatican II took a lot of these principles and played with them and brought them into the, into the Catholic Church. But the most important one, well, before I go to the most important one, on the far right, you see something up there. It's a little bit hard to see because there's a little light on the screen, but you see a monk there. The emergent church is very much about taking these ideas and putting a Christian veneer over them. They call it the ancient future, and they're putting a Christian veneer over it, and they're making ideas feel very Christian that aren't Christian at all. And probably the most important aspect of all of this is what I have represented in the top far left. 
That is a very damaged Bible. And how is that damaged? It's damaged by higher criticism. And if there was one thing that makes all of this possible, it's higher criticism. Spirit of Prophecy tells us this. As in the days of the apostles, men tra tried by tradition and philosophy to destroy faith in the scriptures. So today, by the pleasing sentiments of higher criticism, evolution, spiritualism, theosophy, and pantheism, the enemy of righteousness is seeking to lead souls into forbidden paths. Very prophetic statement. I have it here, Acts of the Apostles, page 474. Sorry that it's cut off a little bit. We might lose a few things there. To many, the Bible is a lamp without oil because they have turned their minds into channels of speculative belief that bring misunderstanding and confusion. The work of higher criticism in dissecting, conjecturing, reconstructing is destroying faith in the Bible as a divine revelation. It is robbing God's word of power to control, uplift, and inspire human lives. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 16. There's a passage I want to read. Revelation chapter 16. And we're going to look at verse 13. I think of this as the three frogs passage. It says this, Revelation 16 verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So three spirits like frogs, undifferentiated frogs. Listen to this. For they are the spirits of the devils, of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Okay. We should all be good students of prophet, a prophecy, right? Well, we've got, we've got imagery here, and what does it all mean? Let's, let's see if we can do a little refresher and, and remember. So these three frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, or paganism, correct? And out of the beast, or the papal system, correct? And out of the mouth of the false prophet, or the apostate Protestant churches, so we're looking at these three frogs. They look the same, right? There's no difference between one frog and the next. And it's coming out of the mouth of the papacy, paganism, and apostate Protestantism. And they go forth to deceive working miracles. Let's look and see what we can find. Let's spend some time studying into this. So... Let's start looking at the false prophet. I want to direct your attention to a man named Jürgen Moltmann. Jürgen Moltmann is a theologian, uh, very revered by the emergent church movement in the emergence. Basically this, he was born in 1926. He's a professor emeritus of systematic theology at the University of Tübingen. Have any of you ever heard of the University of Tübingen? I see one hand there. You're a good Bible student. If any of you know University of Tübingen, it's famous for one thing, uh, many things probably, but one of the things that it's very famous for is that this is the birthplace of higher criticism. So this is where he's at. He's a professor of systematic theology. He's made significant contributions to a number of areas of Christian theology. Now let's look at this. This is all from Wikipedia. Systematic theology. Now that's a big fancy word. Um, what is systematic theology? Do you people know? That's one of those things that a lot of people just don't understand, but I'm going to tell you everybody has a systematic theology. And Adventists have one of the most developed systematic theologies of anybody. A systematic theology is that overarching theology that everything else fits into. So for Seventh-day Adventists, a systematic theology for us is the great controversy. It's the great controversy theme. It's that, it's that big story that you tell that all your theology goes into. So he, he looks at systematic theology, eschatology, in time events. That's near and dear. It's in our name, right? And the theology of creation. 
Now, isn't that kind of interesting that that's the third thing that he's big on is creation? What's the Sabbath all about? We're remembering the creator, right? Look at who he was influenced by. He's influenced heavily by Hegel's philosophy of history. Hegel is one of these guys. It's the French Revolution era. The Frankfurt School, which is Marxist. Now, I think it's worthwhile to know a little bit about the Frankfurt School. Anybody here heard of the Frankfurt School? I got a little little bit of uh, recognition there. The Frankfurt School is very interesting. They're Marxists, but they're nonviolent Marxists. They believed in everything that Marx said, and they pushed. They wanted to have that same communist paradise that Marx was uh, that Marx was pushing as the communists did, but slowly. They're gradualists. And so what happened is, is they parted ways with the regular Marxists and they moved to Frankfurt. And then when World War II broke out and those problems were starting to happen, some of them moved to the United States. And it's actually these thinkers that brought us the sexual revolution in the United States. But it's a gradualism. It's they have time to implement Marxism. And really, that's the kind of Marxism you're seeing here in the United States today. So, also influenced by Ernest Bloch's philosophy of hope. This is another big thing in the emergent movement. You'll hear them talk about hope all the time. We'll see more of that tonight. He developed his own form of liberation theology. Some of you may remember that liberation theology is a kind of Marxist theology. It was big in Central and South America back in the 1980s and maybe before that. Listen to what he has to say. This is a quote from him. He says this, The atheism that wants to free men and women from superstition and idolatry and the Christianity that wants to lead them out of inward and outward slavery into the liberty of the coming kingdom of God. So Christianity and atheism, he says, These two do not have to be antagonists. They can also work together. Which of them will prove to be stronger in the long run is something we may confidently leave to the future. Wow. He's going to take Christianity and atheism and make them work together. And which one will be stronger? He doesn't know, but he's confident we can leave it to the future. Very, very emergent thinking. So he was heavily influenced by Hegel. And it's worthwhile to look at Hegel as we're going through this and looking at the emergent church. Um, George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel, uh, born in 1770, died in 1831. He was a German philosopher who revolutionized European philosophy and was influential to Marxism as well as other branches of continental philosophy. Now, listen to what has been said about him. This Maurice Morlot ponty wrote that all great philosophical ideas of the past century, the philosophies of Marx and Nietzsche, phenomenology, which is uh, looking at the, at the science of, of the brain and who you are, German existentialism, we're going to talk a little bit about existentialism, and psychoanalysis. Freud, right? They had their beginnings in Hegel. This guy is incredibly influential. So, he's, very, he's, he's credited with this thing called the Hegelian dialectic. Now, this is really an outworking that came out after he was done with his work. It's not so much his as what people have done with him. But anyway, this is how it works. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. The world is made up of opposing forces which merge together for a better new whole. Okay, Let's explain this. This is where we get the idea that truth is relative. Have any of you heard the idea that truth is relative? Well, it's relative to what? Well, let's look at it. So, and it's, uh, you have this thesis and this antithesis. These are two different ideas that don't get along with each other. So they're relative to each other. And as these two different ideas that don't get along with each other very well, come together and come with some kind of a compromise, you end up with something called the synthesis. So, let's look at an example of this. Um, Boy, I wish the colors were better, but hopefully you can see those arrows there. Um, So basically, you have this problem. Machines increase productivity. 
that's something that's, that's happened in the 19th and the 20th century, right? And, and we're seeing even bigger productivity uh, uh, movements even, even now today. So that means the machinery takes away jobs. Well, what are you going to do about that? So you, 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 you got more productivity. You don't have as many jobs. So the, the machines are actually creating a problem. So these two things, um, the loss of the jobs and the machinery. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is you can shorten the work week. And so the, the, the world has gone to shorter and shorter work weeks. It wasn't that long ago before we had the crisis in 2008 that France was talking about reducing the work week a whole nother day. I don't hear any talk about that now. But moving on, boy, I wish we could see those arrows. But anyway, I've got those arrows there. Let's apply this to uh, a theological thing. And let's make a little extra twist to it. Now, I just want to tell you something that, that before I did this kind of thing, I was involved in city politics. Some of you may know a little bit about that. Um, but I can tell you we used this philosophy for city politics. And we did exactly what I'm going to show you next. And that's this. If you come together, like we did this in politics where we're negotiating with different people and we finally come up with a solution that we like, well, we can come up with a synthesis before we have the thesis and the antithesis. And so once you figure out the synthesis, where you want to go, then the two different parties would figure out how we're going to present ourselves to the public so that we could get that synthesis, so that we could get the result that we had negotiated. And I'm sure this goes on in big politics, definitely goes on at the local level, and it can go on in, theolo in theological circles as well. And so I don't know that this is the thinking that went into this. I just use this as an example. So universalism, the belief that no one dies, that everyone is ultimately saved. Well, there's a couple ideas that kind of fight together that can be used to come to this idea. And you can start with a false idea. And in this particular case, a false idea is eternal hellfire. Now, it's false because it says it's eternal, and we know that that's not the case. Um, and that deals with the problem of unlimited love. God is love, and there's just unlimited love. So how does eternal hellfire get along with unlimited love? Well, maybe the solution is, is that nobody actually has to go through eternal hellfire, and so you can have universalism. Ellen White has this to say. What a terrible deception is upon the minds of those who think that the world is growing better. Turn with me, if you will, with your Bible to Colossians 2 and verse 8. Whoops. Went right by it. Colossians 2 and verse 8, the Bible gives us this admonition. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The Bible is warning us to be careful of the people like Hegel. Well, what is the emergent church? Where do they, where do they get the name? Why do they call it the emergent church? I want to introduce you to this idea. I got this from Ken Wilber. I'll be talking about Ken Wilber more later. All you need to know is that he's a Buddhist, but we'll talk about that more later. And this is something called the great chain of being. It's based on medieval pagan philosophy. And I apologize, I wish I could have made it bigger. There's just no realistic way to get it bigger on the screen. But if you look very carefully, what you have here is, is kind of the structure of the universe. Uh, this was drawn in 1579, so this is really old. Um, and it comes from a book called Rhetorica Christiana. Now, I'm not a speaker of Latin, but I can figure that out. Rhetoric, which is what we're doing, we're speaking and Christiana, Christian. So it's a book, Christian Rhetoric. And when you look at this thing, 
it shows the universe, and at the bottom of the universe is hell, and you can just barely make out Baphomet there at the very base. He's in hell. And then you move up this chain, and you can see there's plants and trees, and then there's fish and birds, and then there's mankind, and then there's the angels. And sitting at the very top of all of this is God. And they call this the great chain of being. Now, let's think about Hegel for a little while. Remember what uh, Moltmann said as well. He talked about atheism and Christianity fighting together, right? And here we have this, this, this issue of spirituality as opposed to evolutionary materialistic determinism. Evolutionary materialistic determinism. Atheism. You know, that's the world we live in today. We've got the spirituality on one side and you've got this atheist materialistic world. Well, what happens when you have these two ideas fight together? Well, you end up with something called emergent spirituality. It's an evolutionary spirituality. And this is where we get the name emergent church. So let's look at this. This is the theory behind it all. You have the Big Bang first, right? And from there, you have matter. Next, you have the origin of life. And after that, higher life forms. And after higher life forms, primitive man. And after primitive man, spiritual man. Can you see where this is going? Because after spiritual man, divine consciousness emerging. They're taking Darwinism and they're applying it all the way into the spiritual realms. And they're taking Darwinism and applying it all the way to God. There's a problem with this. And the problem is, it doesn't work. It isn't true. Now, I got this slide from a spiritualist website. And... This is instructive, too, as to what's going on with the emergent movement. Um, this is uh, a graph here. And on it, you can see great religious traditions in each little colored slice, kind of like a, a, a piece of a pie. And you see Christianity up there. You can see the yin and the yang. You can see Judaism. One of those is Islam. One of those is Hinduism. I'm not quite sure which, and I'm not sure what they all represent, but be that as it all may, this is the theory behind this uh, spiritualist uh, website and what they're trying to convey here, and hence the coexist. On the exoteric, in other words, the part of Christianity that you can see, or Buddhism, or, or whichever religion you're in, everyone is divided. As you move in, though, you can have an esoteric Christianity. You can have an esoteric Buddhism, an esoteric Islam. We have that. In Christianity, it's monasticism, primarily. In Buddhism, they have esoteric Buddhism. I didn't know anything about this. I didn't even believe it existed. I, you know, the communists don't do a very good job keeping religious secrets. It's kind of interesting to go to a communist country and go to a museum about religion. I was in Hong Kong, and I went to a museum about Buddhism, and the whole theme of it was esoteric Buddhism. So I can tell you it absolutely exists, and it's weird stuff in there that you don't normally associate with Buddhism. So you have the esoteric Buddhism. In Islam, you have something called Sufism. And there's probably other varieties of these things. But they all have this esoteric. Now, the only way to be involved in the esoteric, you have to be initiated in. You can't just join. That's the nature of it. It's secret. And it's all mystical, and it's all meditation. All of them. And so as you come into your esoteric traditions there, you can see that in the, in the middle ring there, eventually that's going to lead you to truth. And if you look at this truth here, it's completely undivided. Everyone can move from esoteric to esoteric, to the same truth. This is what spiritualism teaches, and hence coexist. Turn with me, if you will, to Genesis. I want to look at Genesis 3. 
going back to the Garden of Eden and the original lies told by Satan. Genesis 3, and let's look at verses 4 and 5. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, oftentimes, when I've heard this preached, um, we're focusing on state of the dead, and ye shall not surely die. But I want to focus on a different lie. This other lie is the lie of the emergent church. It says this, and ye shall be as gods. That is one of the big lies that Satan told, and it's the same lie he's telling again now. Spirit of Prophecy says this, And to complete his work, he declares to the spirits that true knowledge places man above all law. Now think about that. What does it mean to be placed above law? And whatever is, is right. And God doth not condemn and that all sins which are committed are innocent. This is ultimately where this is all going. And if you believe those things, you are making yourself to be God. So we've looked at Moltman. He's the, uh, the false prophet, right? Let's move on to the beast. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. He lived from 1881 to 1955. He was a French philosopher and a Jesuit priest. Now, this is really interesting. He was trained as a paleontologist and a geologist and took part in the discovery of Peking Man. I don't know if any of you remember Peking Man or know anything about Peking Man, but this is really interesting. You know, it, since he participated with that, you'd think that his career would just be dead. After Peking Man, the guy should be bussing tables. Peking Man was a discovery of the missing link for human beings. Half ape, half man. It's the missing link. And for years they went on saying, this is it. We found it. Problem. When someone really looked at it, you know what they, you know what they had? They had a human skull and an orangutan jaw, and the whole thing was a fraud. Now, um, Chardin was working with the main paleontologist who had found it, and when they went back to his lab, they found out he had a bunch of these different missing links that he'd put together from different animals. Totally, totally fraudulent, yet uh, Chardin is very influential. And we'll just listen to what he has to say. He conceived of the idea of the omega point, a maximum level of complexity and consciousness towards which he believed the universe was evolving. Remember our great chain of being and where we're going with that? Same thing. Listen to what he said. Oh, a little bit about, more about him. In his posthumously published book, now, every book he wrote was posthumously published. And the reason why is he was a little too radical for the Catholic Church at the time and the Pope asked him not to publish anything. He's really rehabilitated at Vatican II, and we'll see more about his rehabilitation. So, in his posthumously published book, The Phenomenon of Man, Teilhard writes of the unfolding of the material cosmos from primordial particles to the development of life, human beings, and the conscious thought, and finally to his vision of the omega point in the future, which is pulling all creation towards it. This cosmic body of Christ extends throughout the universe and comprises all things that attain their fulfillment in Christ so that the body of Christ is the one single thing that is being made in creation. Think about that evolution, right? Teilhard describes the cosmic amassing of Christ as Christogenesis. According to Teilhard, the universe is engaged in Christogenesis as it evolves towards its full realization at Omega, a point which coincides with the fully realized Christ. It is at this point that God will be all in all. Now, Teilhard was praised by Pope Benedict XVI 
And in July 2009, Vatican spokesman Friar Federico Lombardi said, by now, no one would dream of saying that Teilhard is a heterodox or an apostate, a her heretic, a heterodox author who shouldn't be studied. He was also noted for his contributions to theology in Pope Francis's 2015 encyclical, Laudato Si. So this guy is current. Listen to what he says. Talking about the 20th century, he says, Our century is probably more religious than any other. How could it fail to be with such problems to be solved? The only trouble is that it has not yet found a God it can adore. Oh, my word. Amazing. Amazing and chilling at the same time. Spirit of Prophecy says this, Especially should we entreat the Lord for wisdom to understand his word. Here are revealed the wiles of the tempter and the means by which he may be successfully resisted. Satan is an expert in quoting scripture. I mean, look at Teilhard, the way he's quoted it. Placing his own interpretation upon passages by which he hopes to cause us to stumble. We should study the Bible with humility of heart, never losing sight of our dependence upon God while we must constantly guard against the devices of Satan. We should pray in faith continually lead us not into temptation. Okay, Ken Wilbur, he's a Buddhist. So we've seen the false prophet, we've seen the beast, and now let's look at the dragon. He was born January 31, 1949, Oklahoma City. He's an American Neoplatonic writer and a public speaker. He has written and lectured about mysticism, philosophy, ecology, and developmental psychology. You're starting to see a theme going on here, right? His work formulates what he call, calls integral theory. He's heavily influenced by Buddhist gurus and mystics like Aldous Huxley. Huxley's known for his interest in parapsychology, interest in religious, uh, Eastern religion, belief in universalism, and use of psychedelic drugs. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting is you're looking at the emergent churches. The guys that are involved in this, this is a new thing, and they tend to be alive. And so you can go on and you can watch these guys on YouTube if you feel like it. And I was watching him, and he was telling people that they should take drugs so that they could have their mystical experiences. He was saying that that was a good thing. Bill Clinton, Al Gore, and Deepak Chopra have mentioned Wilbur's influence. The guy is influential. Um, Rob Bell, uh, one of the uh, pastors in the Emergent Church movement, a Protestant, says this, For a mind-blowing introduction to emergence theory and divine creativity, set aside three months and read Ken Wilber's A Brief History of Everything. And like I said, he's the guy that introduced me to this great chain of being. So he's very eclectic and moves into um, uh, Christian spheres. The guy's definitely got an agenda to go after Christians. Listen to what he says. Are the mystics and the sages insane? Because they all tell variations on the same story, don't they? Maybe the evolutionary sequence really is from matter to body to mind to soul to spirit, each transcending and including, each with a greater depth and greater consciousness and wider embrace. And in the highest reaches of evolution, maybe, just maybe, an individual's consciousness does indeed touch in infinity. A total embrace of the entire cosmos. A cosmic consciousness. Remember? The cosmic Christ? Same as Teilhard. That is spirit awakened to its own true nature. Ugh, scary stuff. It's at least plausible, he says. Oh, my. So let's move this uh, conversation now. This, and, and they love to say that. I'm being very emergent by saying that. Let's move the conversation. I want to talk about um, some of the leaders. What we've talked about here, these are the, the, the big thinkers. These are the philosophers behind the movement, right? Let's talk about the people that are leading the people that interact with the people. Um, one of the, uh, uh, this is a, a Protestant, one of the leaders. He's a pastor. His name is Tony Jones. He describes himself as an American theological provocateur. It's interesting that he would describe himself that way. As you look at the emergent church, they like to play with the language a lot, and they also like to be provocative. And what better way than to be a provocateur? Um, you'll see more of this. They're kind of into like social justice, social justice warrior kind of attitudes. 
Anyway, he's an author, a blogger, and a speaker who's a leading figure in the emergent church and postmodern Christianity. This is what he has to say. So I've poked around trying to figure out exactly what's going on in the emerging church. If there's one core conviction that I can put my finger on, it's an eschatology of hope. What I mean is that folks who hang around the emerging church tend to see goodness and light in God's future, not darkness and gnashing of teeth. Rejecting the view that we're on a downward spiral, and when things down here become bad enough, Jesus will return in glory. This is a very different end-time scenario than what we as Seventh-day Adventists believe. God's promised future is good, and it awaits us, beckoning us forward, and we are caught in the tractor beam of redemption and recreation, and there's no sense fighting it, so we might as well cooperate. Remember Teilhard de Chardin was saying we were all being pulled forward into the consciousness of Christ? They have, there's a lot of things here that we can unpack. The beckoning us forward, a tractor beam of redemption and recreation. We're involved in the creation process. We'll see some more of that as we, as we move on. But they love having this re thing. When you see things with a re on it, there's a good chance you're looking at something that's emergent. Now, what's happened is that uh, it's become popular and so I'm convinced that there's a lot of people who just don't know what they're doing and they just stick a re on it because they think it, it sounds good. <laughs> this is what he says. Hope-filled belief generally leads emergent Christians to reject eschatologies that end in a disastrous end of the cosmos. In other words, they're rejecting Judgment Day. They're rejecting the Second Coming. And if this isn't preaching peace and safety, I don't know what peace and safety is. Turn with me, with your Bible, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians. We'll go to chapter 5. Whoops. These little books, you can just flip right through them so quickly. And um, let's start in verse 1. It says this, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief into the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Amen. And so I challenge each one of you to be a children of the light. Doug Paget, another uh, preacher in the Emergent Church. He's an author associated with the Emergent Church movement and founding pastor of Solomon's Porch in South Minneapolis. He's also a senior fellow with Emergent Village, a generative friendship of missional church leaders around the world, and a leading architect of the Emergent Church discussion. They love to use words that you don't understand. I don't know what generative means in this context. Missional is a word that you're going to see a lot. Um, we'll explain it a little bit more later, um, but missional just means missionary without the evangelism. So, missional church leaders around the world leading architect in the emergent church discussion. Everything is conversation. Everything is discussion. And why is that? Well, if you think back to the Hegelian dialectic, because it's this discussion where the two ideas go and work together and come up with a new solution. This is what he says. God is constantly creating anew, and God also invites us to be recreated and join the work of God as co-recreators. Look at the way he plays with that. It's really interesting, but you got that re again. Imagine the kingdom of God as the creative process of God re-engaging in all that we know and experience. When we employ creativity to make this world better, we participate with God in the recreation of the world. Wow, man-centered philosophy. 
Progressional dialogue, on the other hand, involves, and remember we were talking about discussions and conversation? Progressional dialogue involves the intentional interplay of multiple viewpoints that leads to unexpected and unforeseen ideas. I would just say supposedly unexpected and unforeseen ideas. The message will change depending upon who is present and who says what. Remember, all truth is relative, right? And so it depends on what thesis and antithesis you have there as to what the final message will be. He goes on to say, the contemporary church makes two mistakes regarding the function and relationship of the Bible. The way they speak just drives me nuts. One is to think of her, the Bible, as a stagnant telling of all the desires of God. Well, look. You can call it stagnant if you like, and I'm sure the devil would like to do that. But I'm going to tell you, this is the unchanging eternal word of God. Amen? Amen. <laughs> There's nothing stagnant about it. And I love, uh, these people drive me nuts. <laughs> this is supposed to be a telling of the desires of God, as if, you know, well, this is just something that he desires. It's, no, God has a plan. He's the ruler of the universe, and he, he stoops to tell us. This is not just some book of desires. Listen to the other mistake we make with the Bible. The other is to think of her as something from which we extract truth, whether in the form of moral teaching or propositional statements. They don't like taking moral teachings, moral truth from the Bible, because the Bible is unchanging. What does that do to your dialogue? What does that do to your evolution? Stops it dead in its tracks. Turn with me in your Bible to 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter 3. And the Bible says this. Chapter 3, verse 1. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words that were spoke, spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of our Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lusts. Don't we see that today? And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's uniformitarianism. And if you understand your, your evolutionary biology, that's critical. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, creation, right? And the earth standing out of the water and in the water. And then, check this out in verse 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished the flood you know the first thing that these scoffers had to do away with was the flood and it was after they dealt got got rid of the flood that they were able to start talking about billions of years and and other things about biological evolution but verse 7 but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men that's the eschatology they don't like but beloved be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day the lord is not slack concerning his promises some men count slackness but is long suffer suffering towards us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. God loves us. Yes. Amen, so who are these people? Are they atheists or are they theists? It's hard to say, isn't it? Dr. Barry Taylor, I find this guy fascinating for some reason. Um, he's the associate rector at All Saints Episcopal Church in Beverly Hills. He also teaches theology and culture at Fuller Theological Seminary, and he teaches advertising and design at the Arts Center College of Design in Pasadena, topics that were part of his theological doctoral study program. What an interesting mix. What an interesting mix. Both of these are leading institutions. 
This is what he has to say. We live in a post-Nietzschean world of faith and spirituality. Nietzsche's declaration that God is dead still holds true. Do you remember Nietzsche? He's the guy that says God is dead. You killed him. And the reason why he's saying that is because you've all become atheists. And in the process of becoming atheists, there's no more room for God, so he's dead, right? The big thing that, that, uh, that uh, Nietzsche was trying to push during his lifetime is he said, look, you guys are a bunch of atheists, now live like one. He was mad that the other atheists weren't actually living like atheists. So Nietzsche's really taking it to an extreme. And he died a horrible death, if you want to read about it. It's a little debate as to exactly what caused it, but anyway. Nietzsche's declaration that God is dead still holds true since interest in all things spiritual does not necessarily translate to a belief in a metaphysical God or tenets and dogmas of a particular faith. Watch how he plays with the language now. God is nowhere. God is now here. All he did was move his space. God is present. God is absent. The future of faith rests in the tension between these words, and it is from this place of discomfort and complexity that new life emerges. That Hegelian conflict. When discussing the conversion of African slaves to Christianity, W.E.B. Du Bois, who was a very famous author, argued that Africans did not convert to Christianity, but rather converted Christianity to the basic themes rhythms and interests of African religion. Now, the sad thing is, is that he's partially, in a very small way, right, because a lot of things from Africa came into the music. In considering the future of Christian faith in the 21st century, I find this idea of reverse conversion to be really helpful. Now, think about that for a second. Let me see. Reverse conversion. What would that be? apostasy he just doesn't want to use the a word he's using reverse conversion instead of apostasy this is what he says we need a conversion of sorts a reverse conversion to the themes rhythms and interests of post-secular western culture he's saying we need apostasy whether Christianity has any future at all as a vibrant expression of faith in the man from Galilee is a matter of debate as far as I'm concerned. Sounds like Moltmann. Says this. This is really interesting. The Rolling Stones began sympathy for the devil by singing, please allow me to introduce myself. Many view pop culture as the devil. We want to flip the script of our understanding of pop culture to look closer at what lies behind the music. Remember what they were saying about creativity and human creativity working to, to make all good things, right? This is the outworking of that. He's looking at pop culture to look at human creativity to try to find good. Consequently, this book will offer sympathy for pop culture, suggesting that God shines through even the most debased pop culture products. The most debased pop culture products. Wow. Consider this a via pastiva. Now, please allow us to introduce ourselves. Look at how he's playing. If you know the Rolling Stones and what that song was all about, he's really playing with things there. It's a scary, scary thought. So they're trying to deal with this problem. And this problem, remember, was atheistic, materialistic, determinism has no meaning in life. There's no love. There's no nothing. We're just a little biological machine. So how do they solve that? Well, they have a solution, and that solution is the leap of faith. And for that, we kind of go back into the French Revolution Enlightenment era. Um, it's a little bit after the French Revolution. But anyway, Soren Kierkegaard, he's an existential philosopher. His influences include Swedenborg, Hegel, Fitch. He has this to say, the church should not try to prove Christianity or even defend it. It should help the single individual to make a leap of faith, the faith that God is love and has a task for that very same single individual. Now look, the Bible says, come, let us reason together, right? And we're supposed to base our faith on scripture, on reasoning. They're talking about something completely different here. They're talking about a genuinely blind leap of faith. They have to talk about this. They don't have a choice because 
they live in a materialistic, deterministic world. And so here you have this problem, and the solution is a leap of faith. So this has been described as living in a lower room, and we'll uncover the upper room here in a second. The lower room is materialistic determinism. It's matter. It's daily life. It's what we do every day. And then if you can make that leap of faith, then if you're a good atheist, you'll call it an existentialistic experience. How many of you were taught existentialism in high school and couldn't understand what in the world they were talking about? I hated studying existentialism because I didn't understand it. But there's a whole other word for it, and it's mysticism. And so if you, can, if you can have this mystical experience, then all of a sudden you're transported from this lower room materialistic determinism into an existential experience, a mystical experience, a spiritual experience. And this is what a lot of the practices of the emergent church are all based upon. So as I was looking at the emergent church, I was kind of going like, okay, what's next? I wanted to know what's next. I I wanted to see if it would confirm what I've been looking at. And um, I Googled this, and this was like the first or second thing to show up on the list. And it said this. This is from uh, Emerging Voices. This is one of their blogs, one of their important blogs. And it said, from emergent church to emergent God. Grounding our lives in the emergent God reminds us humbly that God is the next big thing, not the movement. We discover our meaning and belonging not ultimately through a like-minded cohort or titling trend, but through our bodies and souls riding the wave of God's emergence. That's what this whole thing's about. Ellen White had this to say, All through my life I've had the same errors to meet, though not always in the same form. In Living Temple, the assertion is made, Now, we'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow, but Living Temple, the assertion is made that God is in the flower, in the leaf, in the center. But God does not live in the center. The word declares that he abides only in the hearts of those who love him and do righteousness. God does not abide in the heart of the sinner. It is the enemy who abides there. So we'll talk more about the Living Temple, but I want to end talking about Brian McLaren, and you'll see why he kind of plays into all this stuff. Brian McLaren is a prominent Christian pastor, author, activist. There you go. You get to see that activist thing again. A speaker and leading figure in the emerging church movement. And sadly, he's someone that's invited from time to time to come speak on our campuses and at our institutions. Um, Listen to what he has to say. What if Jesus' secret message reveals a secret plan? Wait, wait, wait. Secret message? Secret plan? No, no, no. This is Christ's message. Amen? Amen. And he says, I I, I spoke openly to you. I don't have a big secret. So any secret message and secret plan can't be Jesus's. What if he didn't come to start a new religion? Look at at what they're looking at. It's all-encompassing. But rather came to start a political, social, religious, artistic, economic, intellectual, and spiritual revolution that would give birth to a new religion world. Wow. This is more than just religion. He says that perhaps all along, my deepest joy has never been to have all of my dreams come true, but rather to have God's one dream come true, that this world will become a place God is at home in, a place God takes pride and pleasure in, a place where God's dreams come true. What a terrible way to talk about God. God has a plan, and God wants to come back and to save us. He, this is peace and safety kind of talk all over again. But listen to this. Is it any surprise that it's sticking hard to convince churches that they have a mission to the world when most Christians equate personal salvation of individual souls with the ultimate aim of Jesus? Is it any wonder that people feel like victims of a bait and switch when they're lured with personal salvation and then hooked with church commitments and world mission? He doesn't like the Great Commission. This way of seeing God stands ahead of us in time at the end of the journey. This is his, his way he sees us. 
sending to us in waves, as it were, the gift of the present, an inrush of the future that pushes the past behind us and washes over us to rethink and receive new direction and new empowerment. I felt that every tree, every blade of grass, and every pool of water become especially eloquent with God's grandeur. Somehow they seem to become transparent, or perhaps translucent is the better word, because each thing in its particular particularity was still utterly visible and unspeakably important. These specific concrete things became translucent in the sense that a powerful, indescribable, invisible light seemed to shine through. It was the exuberant joy of simply seeing these masterpieces of God's creation and knowing myself to be among them. It was to be one of them and to feel and know that we, all of these creatures, molecules, and phenomena, were together known and loved by God who embraced us all into the ultimate capital W, w we. This is pure pantheism. Pure spiritualistic pantheism. Ellen White had to say this, the sophistries regarding God and nature that are flooding the world with skepticism are the inspiration of the fallen foe who is himself a Bible student who knows the truth that it is essential for the people to receive and whose study it is to divert minds from the great truths given to prepare them for what is coming upon the world. So what did we see? We saw the Hegelian dialectic, the great chain of being, where evolution is going beyond just life and moving into spiritual realms, where we all can come together and coexist around a single truth. Ellen White said this, Be not deceived. Many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I believe we're looking at those three frogs. We have now before us the alpha of this danger. The omega will be of a most startling nature. It's good to see you here this weekend. I, I'm impressed that people are here to learn about what is facing us. But I want to challenge you. Keep your eyes upon Jesus Amen. and keep your eyes upon his word. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your divine word, everlasting and unchanging. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of the spirit of prophecy to help us see through these difficult times that we're in today. Lord, I pray for this earth. I pray for our church. Lord, we know many will be deceived, but Lord, I pray we know that you will do everything you can for you are long-suffering toward us that all may be saved, that can be saved. And so, Lord, I just ask that you keep your hand upon us. And, Lord, may we be good and faithful witnesses for you and for the truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.